Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and the topic of today's show is whether God has a free will and God defined as the causal past. You know, this show is basically about, you know, human beings, whether or not we have a free will. But it's just a very interesting consideration to consider um, whether God or the universe is compelled in, in everything it does or whether it's free to choose. Okay, <laughs> before we get to that, um, yeah, the purpose of this show is um, to refute the myth of free will. I mean, it's an illusion, and um, there are very good reasons to predict, to believe that as we as individuals and as a society and as a civilization overcome this illusion, we can uh, create a much better, more harmonious, more cooperative, less competitive, less aggressive, um, personal and, um, and global world, I guess. Okay, um, if, you know, there, there are 30 episodes of this show already on the internet. Um, if you go to causalconsciousness.com or Google Exploring the Illusion of Free Will, that's the best way to get to them, or YouTube, just like YouTube Exploring Illusion of Free Will, uh, for some of them, actually. Um, all right, um, now before we g I get into the topic, I just want to define <coughs> free will, what we mean by free will. And for this show, it's going to be a little interesting because, you know, again, we're applying it to God, you know, which is like kind of like a theological concept. But, um, or, you know, it's actually, you know, it depends on how you define God, but basically when when we say free will, what we mean is that, like, we, or God in this case, could do whatever um, we want, that nothing is compelling us to do anything that is not completely up to us. And that's the thing. It's, it's a matter of control, that, that we have the control in everything we do. And, you know, just very, very briefly, very basically, the two main reasons we don't and they're very simple. Um, <clears throat> first is causality. Just the idea that if everything has a cause, then, um, then every decision has a cause. So what happens is you make a decision and that has a cause. Okay, and there, there's a cause for that cause, right? And the thing about cause, you gotta remember about causes, is they always come in the past. A, a cause can never come let's say, after a decision, you know, the cause of the decision can't have come, you know, after the decision is made. It also has to, it all always has to come in the past. So the idea is that, like, if, if every decision has a cause and everything that happens has a cause, everything that has a cause, then every cause has a cause and you have this causal regression. You have, like, the cause for that cause, which exists, let's say, a moment before it, and then the cause for that cause, which exists a moment before that. And then you tally up all these moments, you know, moment by moment, seconds, whatever, going into the past, causes, leading to causes, leading, leading to causes, leading to the events that are happening now. You can easily understand that the causes, the chain of cause for whatever we do, um, you know, stretches back way before we were born, way before the planet was created. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's completely amazing. But, but that's like, that's one way to understand that uh, free will is an illusion, a very simple way. Um, the second way is, is one that I, I think I'm just like beginning to really, yeah, just uh, consider perhaps more important th than the causality, because causality gets like involved, some people believe that there's actually randomness, true randomness, and it gets into physics, it get con gets confused. There's really, uh, with the physics, there's no genuine evidence that, um, that we don't have free will, but it's, the physics has kind of like confused even some physicists. So, so a more simple way to understand why we'd have a free will may be the idea that we have an unconscious. Okay, and, and I, I, I got to go through this, um, try to do this briefly. Basically, um, we have an unconscious. It's, it was proven over 100 years ago uh, through hypnosis, um, it's proven through neuroscience, you know, <laughs> there, there's no, there's absolutely no, you know, question that we have an unconscious. And, and the thing is, here, here's the thing, every time we decide anything, there are reasons for our decision. Um, and 
what are, what are, where are these reasons going to be stored? You know, where, where is this data uh, upon which we're going to base our decision going to be stored? And the, it can't be stored in our conscious mind because think about it. Our conscious mind can only pretty much focus on one thing or maybe a few things most at a time. You know, it can't really, yeah. And the other thing is like, where is this like information up upon which we're um, basing our decision? If it's in the unconscious, okay, if the conscious mind can't hold these considerations, if it's in the unconscious, and by definition, the unconscious is unknown to the conscious mind, um, that'll tell you why, why free will is impossible. Because when we mean free will, we, we mean that we have a free conscious will. You know, uh, an unconscious will could not be free. I mean, like, you know, or the way we mean it. We mean that it's up to us. All right, so that's, um, and I'm going to go into that a lot more because um, it is important. But let's get, let's get to, the, um, to the topic. Um, all right, when I, when I use the term God, I'm using it in... Um, a theological sense, but also I'm kind of like applying my own personal, um, oh, personal understanding. Okay, because like for example, like I start out with with three qualities of God that are pretty much universal. You know, in in, in a lot of the the major religions, um, that God is omnipresent, that God is omniscient, and that God is omnipotent. So. Okay, and, and the other thing is like, you know, um, I equate God with the universe, okay? Because the idea is if God is omnipresent, omnipresent means everywhere, if God is everywhere, then that has to mean that God must be everything. You cannot be everywhere unless you're everything, okay? So God is everything, okay? So what is everything? That's another name for the universe. So like... I personally would prefer being a person to personify reality, to personify the universe, and you know, um, and you know, kind of like relate to it, understand it as "quote unquote" God. But it's not kind of like the God that um, that we read about in a lot of ways in the Bible and other religious texts. It's more of kind of like a scientific, logical understanding of, of how God must be, you know, what God must be. All right, so, so God is also omniscient, um, and, 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 and God is omnipotent. Okay, um, I want to explain, um, for example, with, the, with God being omnipotent, all-powerful, I mean, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> All right, no, no, never mind. Um, Okay, the, the question is, I was, I was like, you know, I got sidetracked. I was thinking about, like, whether, you know, um, God's omniscience actually prevents human free will. But, like, does, does God's omniscience prevent God from having a free will? Well, if you know everything, if you know everything, you know the result of everything you do before you do it. So if God's going to do something, let's say, you know, I mean, this is kind of like not really rational per se because um, the question of eternity and time and the beginning of everything kind of like transcends reason. But if we were going to go um, back to um, explaining like where... Um, all right, this is difficult to explain. Um, if God, if God knows everything, if, if he's omniscient, then he cannot have a free will because he will have known, you know, from the eternal past in his existence, um, everything he was going to do after that. If he knows everything, he's got to do it. There, there, there are more reasons, though. Um, okay. Um, a, very, a very powerful one also is like, must God exist? Um, cause I mean, if we, if we define God as everything, then the question is, well, you know, can God suddenly decide of his own free will to, to not exist? 
I don't think so. I think, I think pretty much God is compelled to be God. I don't think God can be other than God. So in that sense, you know, God really doesn't have a free will. God is compelled to do what he does, to be what he does, to be everything, to know everything, to, to be all-powerful. You know, which is, um, it's kind of like, I prefer to, to see God as actually having no free will, as, as actually being as compelled as us, because, um, well, it's for the same reason that kind of like understanding our human wills as causal is, um, is beneficial to human beings. Like, to the extent that we understand that we don't have a free will, that, you know, everything we do is predetermined, then we don't blame ourselves and each other when things invariably don't go the way they could go or should go. <laughs> um, but, so like when we apply this to God, it's the same principle. You know, if, if God doesn't have a free will, we absolutely, um, we, there's no reason to blame him for anything. I mean, like, we're, we're kind of like taught not to blame him anything anyway in religion. I mean, like in uh, church, synagogue, whatever, um, temples, Basically, we're taught that, well, all right, when, when things go well, we, we should thank God, but when <laughs> things go wrong, oh, it's our fault, you know. But, um, but yeah, and this, you know, understanding that God does not have a free will frees us from, from being angry with God, I mean, like, you know, or the universe. Um, okay, so now um, I want to kind of like, yeah, I want to go into the next part of this. Um, God defined as the causal past, because I think this is like, you know, whether God are, has a free will or not, it's, it's kind of like an inter interesting question. It seems like he, he couldn't, but, but I think a much more interesting uh, consideration is that we can actually define God in a very um, scientific, logical, rational way. Um, what happens, consider the entirety of the universe, okay, everything, you know, whether it's infinite, finite, whatever, the entirety of the universe, there's just one, there's one reality, which is interesting when you, when you hear people talking about quote-unquote multiple universes, it's kind of like a um, not very well chosen term because like universe means one, I don't know what verse means, but it means one, so like, so any kind of like a multiverse would really be kind of like a semi-universe or something, or part of, of the one. But, um, but here, like, to understand God as causality, consider that what's happening in the universe right now, everywhere, the, you know, the state of the universe right now was completely dependent, came about completely as a result of the state of the universe at the previous moment, cause and effect. The state of the universe at this exact moment is causing the state of the universe at this moment, which is, you know, a few seconds after the, you know. So basically, that, that's the idea. It's not just our human decisions that is, um, that is governed by cause and effect. Everything is governed by cause and effect. Everything has a cause. Everything has a reason. And so, so what happens, so, you know, it's, so the idea is like, God being everything, or the universe, evolves from moment to moment to moment in a causal fashion. Okay, so if we start with the present moment, um, the present moment of the universe, completely dependent on the previous. And again, the, the key point here is that if we're defining, if, if it makes sense to see God and the universe as synonymous, because it does, if God is om omnipresent, then God is everywhere and God must be everything. If it makes sense to see God in that sense, then I think it also makes sense to see God as cause and effect, God as the causal past, as causality, because it's basically God is kind of like a personification in the sense of the process by which the universe evolves from moment to moment. Okay. Um, okay. Now, there, there's a kind of an irony related to this. This is like, yeah, I, I tried experimenting with this um, some time ago, and it, get, it gets pretty um, perplexing. The idea is that, like, we pray to God, and, um, you know, various religions, we have, like, you know, um, written prayers, but we also have, like, extemporaneous prayer, just 
heartfelt prayer that's you know, it's coming right from us. But this is like, this is surreal. This is like pretty cool. The, the reality of these prayers is that like God or the universe, the causal past in this show, because we don't have a free will, compels us to pray to, to God for whatever, you know, a prayer of gratitude, prayer of, of petition, whatever, different kinds of prayers. But so like, so it's really God, you know, kind of like praying to, to God. It's like we're instruments of God. If we don't have a free will, whatever God or the universe makes us do through cause and effect, we do. And, and if, it, if it's a prayer to God, it's like, it's like God is praying to God. And the thing is like, um, I'm not going to like, you know, some people might say, well, if, um, if everything is cause and effect, then, then prayer could in no way be efficacious. I mean, like, what's the point of praying if, if everything is predetermined, if, if everything is causal and everything is, is destined to happen the way it does? Okay, this is an important point. Um, when, if I want to have lunch with someone tomorrow, you know, I, um, the way to go about that is like, maybe to call the person up and ask. Okay, um, so I'm asking, you know. Now, the asking is kind of like a prayer. It's kind of like, you know, I don't know what the answer will be, but asking a person if they want to go to l uh, lunch, it's kind of part of the process of ultimately going to lunch. If I want to, like, go from where I am to the other end of the room, I have to get up and, and walk and all. You know, we have to do things. So the idea is that... Um, with, with prayer, prayer just might be like, like asking another person for something. You know, you can't, if you, if you want something from another person, it just may be that you have to ask. That, that is the, the, the root of the causality that, it, you know. So, and, and again, I don't know, I've, I've, I think I'm familiar with some studies that in a lot of ways prayer hasn't been demonstrated to be efficacious. Um, for a lot of things, but, you know, I think there's conflicting um, evidence on that. I'm not sure. I, I don't want to get into the theology, theology too much on that. Okay. So, so yeah, that's, that's the idea. Um, God, God is causality. God is causality. The causal past, everything that's happening, it's like, right, and, 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 and you know, you're God, I'm God, this, this, this studio is God, the, the planet is God, everything is God. So it's like, so reality is like God evolving from, um, from one moment to the next to the next. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's like, there's a confusion here. I mean, like, y you have to ask, all right, why would God um, kind of like compel us, for example, to like believe that we have a free will? You know, I mean, there's other like deeper questions. Why would God have created pain and evil? Because like that's, Pain is really the only thing that's wrong with the world, you know, and if there was no pain, this would be a paradise. So, um, but, but nonetheless, all right, God is cause and effect. Um, everything, you know, God is the universe. The universe, the universal process is cause and effect. Okay, and we're going to do another show on this uh, relatively soon. Okay, now I, I want to go over why this is important. Um, basically, well, actually, I, no, I, I want to stop talking about whether God has a free will or not. You know, it, it, seems, it seems evident that he doesn't, that God, for example, if, if we define God as good, however we might want to define goodness as, I define it as what creates happiness, then if God is defined as good, then he is compelled to be good. He can't be other than good. That's the thing. So, all right, I think we've, we've done that enough. But, um, so yeah, I want to go back to the human will question. Why it's important to understand that we ha we're getting the fundamental reality, or at least one of them, of our existence completely wrong. I mean, the fundamental reality of our existence, I think, is w that we exist, okay? But then after that, after, you know, you, you recognize and acknowledge that, I think the next fundamental reality is that we act, we do things, we think, we decide, we choose, we, um, we move, 
okay? We, we do things. We, and, and so, like, so to get this second most fundamental aspect of reality completely wrong, just aside from all the, um, the um, confusion, the um, unfortunate um, aggression and blame and all the, the kinds of things that we've talked about in other shows that comes about from ascribing free will to ourselves and, and others. You know, aside from that, it's just the basic, the basic recognition. I mean, you recognize that we're getting like, you know, such a basic fundamental aspect of, of, of our existence wrong. Um, that's got to be important. You know, I, I, tend to, I tend to value truth. You know, science, in a certain sense, searches for truth. It searches for the truth of our physical existence, of what it can observe. Um, we, I think, you know, religions, I think, will agree on this, that basically truth is a better guide to um, our lives, both per personally and so um, societally, than, um, than delusions, illusions, you know. Um, some, and I say this because there's a, there's a philosopher um, in Israel, Saul Smolansky, he, he wrote a book on, on human will, and he, he goes through the, you know, exactly what I'm doing here, you know, just demonstrating how free will is impossible. It, it has to be an illusion. But his take is like, well, no, we shouldn't tell. We shouldn't tell anybody. We should keep this. This should, this, this should be a secret key, uh, kept from everyone because he says like, He's afraid that, um, that if we were to tell, if everybody understood that free will is an illusion, that everything's compelled, everything's kind of like a movie, then that, that people would um, not, not be motivated to do right. To, you know, people would start saying, well, you know, I can do whatever I want because it's not my fault because you can't blame me. And um, all right, that, that argument has a bit of cogency, but you've got to like... You've got to like understand that within the context of other um, <clears throat> motivations that we have. Like for example, um, we are hardwired to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Um, the hedonic imperative. We we you know, and we have to do this. So like the idea is like we are not as a society, as a people, as a world, even as individuals, going to allow people to just get away with well, you know, I can do whatever I want because I don't have free will. Be I mean, one one thing we could say, well, you know. <laughs> I have, no, no, um, okay, um, yeah, the idea is because we, we are so vested in, um, in our personal welfare and the welfare of us as a society, as groups of people, as a culture, we simply would not allow people to, to use that as an excuse to, to do whatever they want. Um, what? we um, would gain, of course, and I've gone over this a lot before, is um, a more understanding reality. When somebody does something wrong, you know, instead of blame leading to aggression, accusation, vindictiveness, you know, um, you know condemnation and all that, I mean, you, the, the, um, <coughs> somebody's wrongdoing would lead to an exploration of why it happened, why the causal past, why God compelled that, why God ha had that happen. Um, so, so this, this, this matter of human will is, I think, important, um, one, because it just is, it, it's so absurd that we could get so fundamental, um, an aspect of our nature, of our human nature, so, you know, so completely wrong. And again, you know, I, um, I'm not going to go into it too much on this show, but I've gone into it in the past. Just there are, there are benefits, there are major benefits to overcoming this illusion. Um, actually, I'll go into um, one myself. I'm going to do a show on this later, but um, the idea is like on a personal level, um, when somebody does something wrong, um, basically the reaction that we tend to um, have is that of, one of anger, okay? And anger, by definition in psychology, um, is a reaction to a perceived injustice, you know? So we, we think the person is doing something that's unjust, wrong, unfair, whatever, 
and, um, and we become angry. And, and so here's the thing, like, that anger, you know, if, if, we, if we attribute, if we um, direct that anger toward the person, um, even if, if we have it at all toward, yeah, it's not going to feel good for us. You know, any kind of anger we have toward another person kind of like uh, acts as a wall between us and them, you know, between um, communication, between, um, you know, um, pleasant interaction. So, um, so it just makes sense. It just makes sense, like, to the extent that you understand that free will is an illusion and that everything is compelled, you know, by God, that nothing is up to us, then all, all the reasons that, that one might have to feel and be angry at another person just evaporate, you know. And that, that's a great gift. That's a great gift to humanity. I mean, like, the closest we've gotten to this is kind of like the, um, the religious idea of forgiveness, and this, this idea of forgiveness, I've got to do a show on this because it basically kind of like understands the causal nature of, of reality. Because why do we forgive? Well, we forgive because humans are imperfect, because we, we're bound to make mistakes, because we have our faults. You know, there's like, there's a recognition. There's a recognition that, yeah, we're going to make mistakes. If, if we had a free will, we, we would not make a single mistake. So we forgive. We forgive. Um, now, the value of understanding that we don't have a free will is like we would forgive. We wouldn't have to forgive because there would be nothing to forgive. All right, so I think I'm running out of time. So I, I hope you understand um, that we can define the causal past as God and that it seems that God does not have a free will, that God's compelled to, to be God. So the universe is like, is like um, unfolding according to its, all, its own predetermined way, you know, again, the, most essentially the, the question of freedom is, um, is difficult. Anyway, I'll, I'll see you again soon. Thanks. Bye.